Good morning. I'm Jason Lake, the Vice President of Marketing here at Alt 5 Sigma, and I want to thank you on behalf of the entire team for taking time out of your busy day to join us on our inaugural live webcast focusing on crypto hacks and the need for cybersecurity. I'm also happy to announce that we will be planning to host these sessions throughout the year in hopes that we can provide you with the most relevant and current information possible. So please stay tuned to our various channels for updates in the weeks to come to hear more about these subjects. Without further delay, I welcome our moderator, Robert Lynch, and our panel of industry experts, who I now provide you with relative and insightful information while educating you on some of the things you should be aware of when engaging in the crypto world. Thank you and enjoy the session. Hey, thanks very much, Jason, and, um, and good morning to you all. Um, when we think about crypto assets and, and DLT technology more broadly, there are many aspects to consider from things like the value and utility of those assets, the, the broadening array of products, uh, including altcoins, DeFi, NFTs, to the way that different types of investors can allocate to the space and more. But, but relevant to and underlying all of these considerations is security. Will my investments remain safe and be accessible when I want them? Today, um, Alt5 Sigma is pleased to bring a panel of true expertise in the field of cybersecurity and crypto um, to highlight and discuss some of the most critical and topical factors in the space. Um, with that in mind, um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, first, uh, Don Codding, Codling, a uh, former FBI agent. Don, could you give a little bit of background about yourself? Yeah, glad to, Bob. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where in the world you happen to be. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I'm Don Codling. I spent almost 24 years in the FBI, the majority of which was in the cyber division, working criminal matters and national security matters. Before that, I worked in the FBI areas of uh, technical operations and technical surveillance, which included how you defend your own networks and how you break into other people's networks. For the last about 10 years, I've been working very, very heavily in the commercial sector in cybersecurity and data privacy, because in certainly in 2021 and from here on, you cannot have data privacy if you don't have cybersecurity. So that's where I come into this and have been involved in the crypto market uh, knowledge and awareness, certainly since its, its inception. Because quite frankly, even back then, law enforcement agencies all over the world were very, very interested and concerned with how these digital assets would be moving around the planet. Thanks, Don. Um, next up, we have Ryan Smith from, from Armor. Hi, Bob and Don. Nice to be on this web conference with you today. Uh, my name is Ryan Smith. Uh, I am the vice president of product and our product evangelist at Armor. Armor is a cybersecurity company uh, primarily focused on helping managed service providers uh, provide the most updated detection and response and security technologies to keep their customers uh, data data safe. So uh, we're really excited to be here to talk about uh, cryptocurrency and cybersecurity, which is a big hot topic for financial institutions, everywhere from the regulations associated with it, uh, and the compliance standards coming down, telling you what you have to do from a security perspective, to overall best security practices that we should be taking to keep our data safe, our customers safe, as we head into kind of this new uh, world that we're living in with cryptocurrency. So excited to be part of the talk today and looking forward to the discussion. Likewise, Ryan, thank you very much. And our third and final panelist is Stuart Jackson from Fireblocks. Uh, good day, everyone. It's uh, Stuart Jackson, as you mentioned, from uh, Fireblocks. So we are predominantly looking at how we can protect people's assets, digital assets and, and cryptocurrencies as well. But ultimately, from a point of view of custody, uh, but also in movement and transit. So ultimately moving those between counterparties and trading venues, whatever it might be, is where we concentrate the effort. And as a technology provider, security is the absolute core of what we do. Now, my background is in cybersecurity. I've worked in software vendors uh, such as Checkpoint and, and BlackBerry in the past over the last 17 years uh, and have worked in many instances with a number of tier one banks, major tier one banks, and uh, also have global reach and, and enterprise expectations, uh, either for delivery, but specifically around security as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Stuart. 
Um, now, we do have some questions lined up for our excellent panelists, but we'd love to hear from you too. So please enter your questions in the space provided, and then we'll try and filter and get to them as we move through the discussion. Um, but with that out of the way, let's, let's dive right into some of the topics that we have lined up. Um, one of the first things we wanna talk about is wallets, hot and cold wallets. What are the pros and cons of each? Why are they used? How do we protect ourselves? Are there scalability issues when we think about individual investors up through industrial space? Um, who would be the best person to dive into that question first? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to dive in here and uh, you know give my response. So uh, hot and cold wallet storage is something that we're all familiar with a, as a kind of thematic concept from how we think about storing our data, right? Hot data means it's readily accessible. Uh, we can use it in our applications. Cold data means it might take more time to retrieve. Maybe it's cheaper to store, et cetera. Well, cryptocurrency has taken that same concept and applied it to uh, how you store and utilize your cryptocurrency with uh, financial institutions, other applications, exchanges, et cetera. A hot wallet is just a software-based application. It can be a desktop application, a web application, mobile application that has connection to the internet. And, you know, the pros of it are that you can e use it to easily trade and, uh, you know, interact with your cryptocurrencies. Uh, best practices from a security practice, though, are you should only really keep in your hot wallet uh, what you need to use it for a transaction at that time. And that applies all the way up to industrial scale of banks and financial institutions offering hot wallets. You only really want to keep uh, liquidity with what you need for active trades, what you need in liquidity pools so your uh, consumers can trade with those cryptocurrencies, et cetera. However, you, know, you want to keep most things in a cold wallet, both on a personal level and at an industrial level. Uh, at a personal level, it looks like this device. This is a Trezor. Uh, they have ledgers as well. They look like many USB devices um, and they plug into your computer and allow you to transfer your cryptocurrency to that device. You then unplug that computer from the network, if you will, and you are uh, taking it and storing it somewhere. You know, we've seen consumers actually store these in traditional banks and uh, lock boxes and safety deposit boxes, things like that. But, you know, here at home, I just have mine in a safety deposit box and, um, you know, uh, with my keys stored. So, uh, you know, I think the benefits of cold wallet are, you know, it, your crypto may not be as readily accessible to trade, interact with, do application, uh, but it is more secure uh, because it's not accessible to the internet, um, you know, and it's kept in a place where only you have access to those private keys. Are, are there costs associated with that? I'm thinking in types of costs that that users, uh, participants in the space need to be aware of, and including those on a custodial on a larger scale. Yeah, some of the cyber uh, regulations, insurance regulations now are requiring, you know, um, or or insuring different parts of that, right? Hot, cold, you know, what is insured, what is and what levels are it, is it insured to? Uh, those things certainly impact. So, you know, I think it's up for the custodial institutions themselves to define the policies that they have around how they're going to manage what's in hot, what's in warm storage, even what's in cold storage, and you know how uh, the regulators will view what you're holding in each of those uh, aspects and the security you have around each of those wallet types. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, um, Ryan, you made an excellent point there. And uh, Stuart and you and I had this discussion a couple of days ago. No bank would be in existence very long if they kept all the money in the teller's drawers at the very front of the bank. That's why you have a bank vault and the bank vault has to be audited and multiple people have to do certain very specific things to be able to access those funds in this case. And, and, uh, and I think there's also a differentiation there as well, is that fully hot may consider to be more uh, risky, if I want to put it like that. Uh, cold would obviously be the extreme, the other end, where it, you, you can't touch it because everything is considered offline. Uh, so where warm plays in the part in this is the ability to be able to have a governance layer that allows you to actually approve 
or sign those transactions with a quorum. And so actually say, well, is, there has to be multiple people involved in the uh, in the delivery or the execution of a trade or whatever it might be. Now, that again depends on the value that you're dealing with. If it's low value, high transaction, high frequency, then hot obviously makes good sense. You're not going to operate that in a cold wallet. Uh, equally, if you've got that in a warm, then you might be in the mid tier, something that isn't $100 million, but is somewhere in the 100000 to a $1 million. And that might sit more comfortably in the warm space. So again, I think what we need to also figure out is it's not just the case of what's insurable, what's hot, what's cold, what can flow. It's actually what's usable and uh, to actually maintain the customer uh, to be to be able to trade. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. Um, we change gears a little bit here and talk about ransomware. Um, when and how are we as investors in the space most vulnerable? How do, how do we protect ourselves? A and, you know, are there stakeholders, our businesses? Um, and if you're attacked, do people actually have to go and, and purchase Bitcoin to, to pay off the, the, the ransomware? Um, and can you catch them? So, and, and what can be done? And I, I know, I suspect, Don, you've probably had at least as much experience in this, um, uh, in this part of the, of the space as anyone. Maybe you could start us off uh, talking about that. Yeah, certainly. That's a that's a very complex compound question you asked, Bob. So let's start at the at maybe the the very beginning. Of course, no, you don't have to pay the ransom if you are hit with ransomware. If you have adequate backups, if you built your systems and networks to be resilient and redundant, you can hopefully reconstitute your entire business, reconstitute your network. And yes, you will suffer some loss. Yes, you will certainly suffer some. Uh, business interruption. But a lot of that stuff now, what I'm seeing in the commercial sector are just good practices of business continuity and disaster recovery. And then you add on the extra piece about ransomware, meaning that it's not a hurricane that hits you. It's a group of Russian criminals that hit you and you know, chop you off at your knees. Uh, there's a, a myriad of things that I would even ask Stuart to, to chime in here on, on a certain level or two of it is a business decision that should be part of your business program, your business process to make a determination of we as a company, as a bank, as a platform or exchange, are we going to pay ransom? If so, how much? Stuart, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's an interesting one, isn't it? Is it <laughs> how, much do you, how much is any piece of data worth? And, uh, and that really comes down to what the decision is between the number of board members and, and various people within that particular institution, that enterprise, whatever it is. And different things have different value. Obviously, that's also a consideration that you have to take into, into bear. So when you're, when you're in a situation where you're looking at business continuity, I think that's where it all starts. If you're looking at BCP, you're looking at the scenario where what happens in a ransomware attack? What, what is the, the scenario? What is it that uh, is a requirement, i.e., do you actually need to red team these things? And ultimately, you will do. You need to have, you need to have that understanding that you've got purple teaming, you've got red teaming, you've got white, black, white, whatever the whatever hat you tend to wear, uh, to make sure that you understand what the potential risk is. And if you can simulate the potential breach or understanding of what that breach might be, then you actually stand a chance of defending against it. If you don't have a clue what you're dealing with to start with then you don't stand a chance of defending against it. So this is nothing new. This has obviously been around for a significant period of time. But I think as we start to digitize the world economy, which is clearly what we're, we're going through right now, then we're going to have to put ourselves in a scenario where we're considering what the potential risks are. And ultimately, if you're able to build that in, then you can defend against that. So what we see is the BCP plans that we are asked for here is what's the situation in a failed state? What's the situation in if you're offline for a period of time? And they are all relating to what happens if you are on, under a, a hack attempt or whatever it might, or DDoS, whatever it might be. Ultimately, if you end up in a ransomware attack, well, that's something which has actually infected your core network. And so that's something where you're, you're, you've, you've got a major issue. Uh, that might be something that's an internal breach. It could just be a network breach. And you've got to figure out where that is. So it's not just about the the, the pre-planning is about the, the ongoing BAU, the business as usual, but then it's also got to be about constant review. 
You've got to look around your systems everywhere and you've got to understand that they have to be up to date and kept up to date because if they're not, then you're opening yourself up for breach. And one thing Stuart and I uh, chatted about uh, separately was you're going to want to have, if there's one lesson learned for some of our audience, you're going to actually want to have a business continuity plan, disaster recovery plan. Yes, you must test it. Uh, I literally went to a client site within the last year. Uh, they pulled the business continuity plan off of the shelf, and it turned out that half the members of the critical incident response team had either resigned, retired, or sadly, one person had died. Therefore, that business continuity plan was kind of useless. Uh, that's number one. Number two is you're going to want to have a paper copy of everybody's phone number who's really important <laughs> because one of the first things the hackers are going to do is lock down your VoIP system, lock down your uh, computer. And by the way, you are not using your phone to look up Stuart's phone number. You want to have that on a piece of paper in a binder. Uh, Stuart and Ryan, what's your favorite color? Because we're going to paint the binder. <laughs> And it's going to go right on the bookshelf where we yeah. can find it. Yeah, <laughs> no, that, that's exactly right, Don. We just saw a hack this week where the ransomware attackers uh, screenshotted and had video of the uh, disaster recovery team and incident management team Slack chats as they were responding to the event uh, was how deep they were within the network. And so, you know, I think that, you know, you can't, uh, underestimate this conversation of backup and recovery, but from a security professional perspective, I do have one ask, and I think it applies to both the backup and recovery scenario, but also the hot and cold wallet scenario we were talking about earlier. Don't keep your backups connected to the network, right? Uh, so many people make this mistake or, uh, you know, from the hot and cold wallet perspective, you know, Coinbase wallet actually gives me the opportunity to back up my secret key to Google Drive. I don't know why anybody would necessarily do this because then there's another piece of information where your secret phrase is in the cloud now, uh, which is even more dangerous because that secret phrase is everything to you. So from the backup and recovery side of ransomware, you know, I think that's one thing. Always keep everything air gapped. Um, you know, but also you can't underestimate the business model conversation part of this is ransomware is a business model at the end of the day for these threat actors. Uh, it's why we've seen an increase of the attacks against the mid market recently, as opposed to just the fortune 500, because it's a numbers game for them. They can go after, you know, 20 schools have 15 of them decide to pay out and you know, the five that don't, that's fine because it's just a business model numbers conversation at the end of the day. So when you're thinking about, do I pay, you know, what what is that type of conversation? The threat actors are thinking of it as part of a business conversation. So you need to be thinking of it in that same way as well. Uh, if you're going to, you know, be effective uh, uh, having these types of security conversations. Maybe to put a quick capstone on that question, Bob, and Ryan just, you know, not only opened the door, but laid the foundation beautifully for this. There are many governments around the world, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, who are in discussions right now of making legislation that you will not pay ransomware. Or if you do, you must report it to us in the following 24 or 48 hours. Yes, it's your business decision, but by the way, you will be telling us you did it. Uh, if you're a publicly traded company, don't think that that's not going to show up on your 10K statement of the, is it the 10K or the Q, which is the quarterly one? Hey, we got hit. We had to pay. That sort of stuff for a publicly traded company uh, becomes quite uncomfortable, shall we say, in certain uh, aspects. And maybe the lesson to learn from all this is, as Stuart mentioned, is you've got to have that business continuity. You want to have a disaster recovery plan. As Ryan mentioned, you want to make intelligent, I hate to say intelligent, you want to make wise decisions on hot, warm, cold wallets, what's separated, what is your lifeboat when everything goes sideways. Yeah, the U.S. already actually has regulations saying if you pay out to a group that's on one of the terrorist watch lists, then you're at risk of, you know, violation of export control standards, things like that. So it's definitely in a space to watch because, as you said, Don, uh, there are hacker groups in countries 
that are on these lists. So, uh, you know, you're, you are at risk of what could happen for, to, from the government side to your business if you pay out. So I, just because this is an area that seems to get so much notoriety, I mean, even people outside of the space hear about these ransomware attacks daily or, or periodically in the news. And I just wanted to kind of touch on it again. So if for custodians, right, large custodians of crypto, um, are, are, are there ways that they maintain the, the continuity of, of, of their programs, maybe run penetra penetration tests? And, and if they do that or other items, how often does that need to happen? So I think from my point of view, we should always expect our providers for any service to, to make sure that their security is tight, regardless of what service they're actually offering, whether it's custodial uh, services of millions or billions of dollars. But I think ultimately there is always penetration tests that should be constantly run a equally by technology providers such as ourselves. We should also be following those rules. We should be understanding exactly what we need to do. You know, we shouldn't ever sit on our laurels and make and say, yeah, we're, we're done here. You know, our security is fine. We'll move on. That's not the way it works. And in fact, it's good practice uh, to actually understand if there are any issues found within a penetration test and then notify the market. And by the way, when we notify the market, it shouldn't just be that we notify the market en masse. It should be a fact that we actually notify our competitors and tell them about a scenario that impacts them as well. And so that everybody at least has a fair understanding of what the issue was, what the implication was. And ultimately, when you build a security model like that, then you, what you're doing is you're actually involving everyone in the solution and so that everybody is secure. Because if you have, if we take a look at a, a hack that happened around, oh, I think it was around 18 months, maybe maybe 12 months ago, uh, which involved Microsoft and it was with a, it was actually with a SIM product. And uh, what they did is they, they hopped onto the, the SIM product was vulnerable and then they were able to access the cloud services and so what you're looking at is that if, if you've got a situation where there's a vulnerability in one area well everybody needs to know how to fix it and it has to be everywhere it can't just be in one place because you're just going to find a hole somewhere else and that's what the hacker's job is and certainly Stuart, to echo and reinforce what you just said my experience not only in the fbi but in commercial sector has been if your neighbor got hit you're next and by the way, the guy is going to try to use the same tactic and technique to attack you if you are a family office, if you are a bank, if you are a money services bureau. Some of these tools are going to be reused. Some of these supply chain attacks, as you're discussing, Stuart, are out there. And that's why you have to have some continuity. You have to have resilience and redundancy in your, in your systems to, A, recognize you're, you're under attack, or my neighbor just got hit, maybe it's time to throw up my defenses. And that's one of the things I know, Ryan, that Armour does. Uh, like, they breathe. They have to do that. You must do that constantly to have any real good hope. I know that's probably poor English. Um, to say, we're doing the very best we can, and we're going to try to stay up on this. Yeah, certainly. I, I think you must penetration test your services. Uh, I would say what you're actually going to find is a lot of these early attacks in the crypto space will take advantage of tactics, techniques, and procedures and vulnerabilities that exist in the internet today. So it'll be where these new technologies meet current web technologies that vulnerabilities lead to hacks. You know, we saw the hack against Badger Dow. Uh, earlier this uh, week or two weeks ago now that led to, uh, to 150 million kind of gone from from the from the institution and uh, it was an api credential stuffing attack that allowed them to get api credentials of the cloudflare account that the uh, badger dow was using and then inject a kind of cross-site scripting javascript to read people's wallets get them to give their wallet information up and then stole cryptocurrency from the wallets so this is a, a OWASP top 10 attack an open web application security project top 10 attack that's been around in in, in the top 10 types of web attacks for the last 10 years now uh, and that was the method not necessarily anything related to the blockchain technology itself so uh, definitely penetration tests and think about you know, uh, all of the things that, you know, 
security professionals have been recommending all these years, multi-factor authentication on systems, you know, next generation AV so you can catch malware associated with ransomware. It's going to be these fundamental controls that do more in these early days of the, the cryptocurrency land uh, for, for these companies because they're all deploying it on, you know, web infrastructure and technology that we know today. So yes, penetration tests, but penetration tests, both the smart contracts and blockchains themselves uh, do bug bounty programs for those, but also, you know, th really think about the interfaces by which you and the consumers are interacting with these blockchain technologies, which is kind of the internet as we know it today. So that, that's really helpful, Ryan. And, and I want to talk about smart contracts in a moment, but are there like, can you, and you laid out one example of, of one of the threats. Are, are there some threats today that are more common than others, something that the, the attendees of the conference need to be more cognizant of if, if you were to kind of try to prioritize them? Um. So I would say the first uh, thing that threat actors will always try and take advantage of is human error, uh, accidents, things that we're doing that leave the doors open uh, because it's easier to walk through an open unlocked door than it is to try and you know hack the lock, right? So what they're going to do is they're going to look for, does anybody have their uh, secret key in the public cloud anywhere? Did anybody leave a customer list with passwords open, you know, in a uh, S3 bucket in AWS, and now I can get into a customer account and move laterally and do damage, you know? So I would say the first thing that we have to do is always education, right? Whether it's education of our, our teams, our consumers, uh, it goes to the battle testing and preparation that Stuart and Don have talked about of running simulations, running tests against, you know, our infrastructure and thinking about that. Uh, it goes putting into place, like there's technologies today, posture management or policy management technologies that uh, Stuart was talking about that act as a governance layer for what can control. So even if we miss something with our things, that governance layer is stepping in there and saying, hey, I've noticed a lot of trades within this amount of time, or you know, this user logged in at a time they don't normally log in. So identifying that type of behavior, I think would be uh, valuable. So, so start with you know, where we are gonna mess up first and then you know, work backwards from there. But then I would say the other kind of things are you know, use firewalls and stuff in front of your servers, put next gen AB there, uh, which is going to detect a lot of ransomware types of activity and anomalous behavior on servers today. Uh, utilize, you know, good backup disaster recovery policies with air gap backups. So if you do get hit, you can recover. So we should always kind of take a posture of we will get hit. Uh, so what do we do if, if we do? So those would probably be the best recommendations uh, from my perspective right now. And I think actually following on from that is that there is a view now or has been for some time now that it's almost futile to try and put in a, a, a prevention strategy because it's almost impossible. There's so many attack vectors. And so if that is the situation you find yourselves in, what I would strongly recommend is that you at least provide yourself with visibility. So if you've got the scenario where you actually have something where you, you feel like the, the game is up and you can't actually defend or prevent it anymore, then make sure you can see it. And so I think that's one of the biggest challenges. I think if we actually refer the conversation back to uh, the world of crypto and, and digital assets in general, obviously the biggest crux for anything to do with uh, this world is the private keys and the protection thereof. Uh, so the ultimate goal is it doesn't really matter what we do with the rest of the system. If you give up your private keys, you may as well just leave the door wide open. Uh, so I think from our point of view, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure in our world and our customers world and our clients, our tier one banks, whomever, whomever it might be, our uh, crypto natives, whomever might be involved at holding any digital assets. We have to make sure first and foremost that the most, the most secure thing that we can provide for our customers is the ability to protect the private key. Because uh, not your keys, not your crypto. Uh, but if it is someone else's keys and you steal them, then it suddenly becomes your crypto. So I think from that point of view, what we need to be able to do is we need to make sure, make absolutely crystal clear that the, the way in which you either establish that private key through different mechanisms. So whether that's a, a straight private public key process 
in PKI, as you would have seen before. Um, but equally, when you actually look into more distributed technologies, such as multi-sig or multi-party computation, so the separation of that private key, so, so much so that it's harder to establish what the signing of a transaction would be to the blockchain. And so therefore, you can start to distribute, you can start to make it harder. Nothing is impossible, but all we can do is make it incredibly improbable. And to follow on with that, Stuart, I'm reminded of the old, uh, uh, maybe American folklore fairy tale. I'm sure they have it also in the UK about if there's two bears in the woods and there's a hunter, one bear just has to run faster than the other. That's you know key to survival number one. Uh, maybe along that same line is, uh, to your point you just made, Stuart, you want to make it more difficult for the adversary, for the enemy to attack you. How do you do that? You put these certain procedures in place. You make it more difficult. What are the bad guys going to do? They are human beings. There are. It's. I'm sorry, everybody. The Terminator is not here yet, the movie. These are all human beings behind keyboards doing things. And they are driven by greed. They are driven by power. They are driven by the desire to do something. And the more difficult you can make them having to attack you, the better off you are, which is why you have those controls. You have some regulatory compliance issues within your networks. Things that Ryan was speaking about, all those sorts of things, a very holistic approach, which quite frankly is one of the refreshing things I found about Alt-5 Sigma, wanting to pull together these best of breed concepts and look at this in a holistic fashion, not a well, I've got the strongest front door in the entire world, and it's really, really strong. And, oh, I left the window open, or it's glass. Where am I going to hit, right? So that's that's kind of this game. And, and, Bob, when you threw that question out, you probably weren't ex expecting this Alice in Wonderland trail, but that's where this stuff ends up, is it goes in so many different directions that you want to put certain controls and certain throttles, if you will, in place so that you can be aware that you have a problem. How do you solve the problem? How do you limit the problem? Because to Stuart's excellent question, you are going to get hit. It's, it's not, not a question of uh, if, it's, it's when, and more importantly, how quickly can you reconstitute yourself? So I mean, that's actually really interesting because you described, all of you described <clears throat> some of the relevant issues around that, but if you're like a financial institution, a family office, wealth manager, um, pension fund, what should you look for in a service provider um, uh, in order to invest in crypto safely and securely? So I think from my point of view, what you should always say look for is, is, is there coverage in the current market? Are they operating in that market? Are they an enterprise focused company? Because if they're enterprise focused, and I, and I know that there are scenarios where if you're dealing with a family office, they may not have the operations and the IT to, to run such an enterprise service. But typically, what you have to do is you have to look for, for trust. Trust in the service provider. Have they, have they got a, a name in the industry? Is it a situation where you're going to another mom and pop shop, running a mom and pop shop, uh, that you're hoping that their security is going to be as good as uh, someone who's investing millions into security. And also, actually, what's interesting is also to look at the, how the company was born. Was it born from a security principle? You know, what, what do the founders look like of the company? Are they developing a piece of software with a mindset of well, we're going to go down the fact that we want to make money and we want to make people money too? Or are they looking at it saying, well, we want to make people money, but we want to do it safely? And so actually looking at the founders, their backgrounds, and ultimately the people that they've hired as well. And then you can really get a good feeling and an understanding for what the company stands for. And ultimately, they, that helps you to develop and understand whether they're coming from a security point of view or whether they're coming from a more financial background, whatever it is. But these types of aspects, when you're making a decision about technology, is you really need to understand what, where the company's come from and what its kind of ethos is. 
Yeah, I would say there's two answers from my perspective. The first is, uh, you know, look for how they interact with different compliance standards handed down from the government. It's kind of an easy way to evaluate, um, you know, what they are or aren't doing, what they pass. Now, compliance isn't everything. Lots of people are compliant and still get breached. There's also compliance regulations still in development around crypto technology. So there will be a lot more to come in this space. But Make sure you ask for, you know, their backup and recovery plans, their compli what, what compliance standards they're held to. Uh, do they undergo pen testing and their latest pen testing reports? You know, these are things that are external validation by the market that they are doing a good job uh, with, uh, you know, building that trust. Right. So I think that, you know, is the first thing uh, from my perspective. Um, and then the second is, uh, you know, kind of to the point of, of what, what is their background upbringing, you know, what, how do they approach this? Do they have a strong partner network or, you know, are they doing it themselves? Like, how are they doing this? Because there's so many aspects of this that we've seen from, you know, preventative measures in kind of what we're used to in kind of security technologies of the past to detection and response against what happens if a breach happens to the actual uh, underlying technology. So Stuart's company doing MPC stuff or multi-sig stuff, hot, cold wallets, uh, and, you know, governance layers that uh, allow us to control trade liquidity and stuff like that. There's so many pieces of this that I think any um, service provider is probably going to have a strong partner network of people that they bring in to help with each of those pieces. Um, you know, I do think we'll see consolidation in that space, but I think early on, this early on in the crypto space, um, having a strong partner network of people that they can rely on can't be uh, undervalued too much. And I'm going to put a shameless plug in for groups like MSSPs, of which Armor is one, where you have a managed security service provider. That is their <laughs> job. That is their business. When I look at their client list, I want to see banks on there. I want to see insurance companies. I want to see people who have to hold very, very sensitive data. And I also want to see people who have to hold, oh, what's that thing called again? Oh, yeah, money. I want to see people who have to hold, protect, move money around. That's number one. Number two is I would go to, for anybody in the audience, I'd go to your insurance carrier. And I would say, hello, Mr. Insurance Carrier or Ms. Insurance Carrier. I would like to see the checklist that you are going to require me to fill out if I'm going to try to get cyber liability coverage. So pick Aon, pick Chubb, pick any one of the big ones that offer cyber coverage anymore. And they will provide you, if you ask, and you're the chief technical officer who's asking, a checklist. And they're going to say, dear Stuart, thank you for thinking about us. Describe your network to us. Describe that you have a data loss prevention program. Describe that you have a smart next generation firewall. And ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you the ones that I've read, and I've probably read 10 separate checklists by now, they are very prescriptive in that they say, are you using CrowdStrike? Are you using this thing? And then my very favorite one was, the next question was, if not, why? How much clearer can it possibly get? If they're going to offer you insurance, that's a fabulous checklist for any chief technical officer, any CISO, any board of director, quite frankly, who's in charge of looking at the cybersecurity posture, data privacy posture of their company to say, are we doing these things? And you don't get to say not applicable. The insurance company doesn't let you do that. They basically go, why aren't you doing these things? Do you have a disaster recovery plan? Do you have a business continuity plan? When was the last time you tested it? When's the last time you did a pen test? He's a super, super valuable resource for anybody listening to this webinar. Go out. If you want to see what you're supposed to be doing, that's a great place to start. Stuart, what do you think of that? I saw you nodding a couple of times because I know you've been the guy helping to fill that thing out probably more than a few times. Uh, not just that as well. Is obviously we're the, the team that also respond 
uh, to the RFIs and the RFPs within the company, any company, any any technical technology company uh, specifically based around uh, security. If I can answer a question saying, look at this report by XYZ auditor, it's an awful lot easier for me to respond to something like that when you actually have something that proves the background of what you're saying. So if you're in a situation where you're, you're running along saying, well, we think we can work like this and we think it works like that, um, all you're doing is you're opening yourselves up. Actually, you're making your life harder as a, a you know, obviously someone who works in the, in the pre-sales function is you're always going to make your life harder to, to actually convince the customer this is the right thing. And if you can't convince your customer to do that, then, then ultimately you don't have a business. So I think from that point of view, it's very keen that actually any kind of certifications, validations, external pen tests, any of those processes that validate your infrastructure and can give trust, as I mentioned, then it's always going to be a good thing. It doesn't matter which way you look at it. It's always going to make your life. And if you can get to the situation in, a, in an RFI or an RFP or something like that, where you're answering a question, and, and uh, to your point, Don, if it specifically calls your company out, guess what? It's, it's pretty much already there. So, it, so the scenario is, is it actually is a good thing for us for, for multitudes of reasons. But ultimately, from a trust point of view and from a pure visibility and security point of view, it makes total sense to do that. So some of what you, all of you just discussed have touched on a little bit of this, but I just want to drill down a little bit on one, one specific area. Um, how does a custodian protect keys? And are there any protocols that are in place or should be in place if those keys are compromised? So if we take a look at what custodians are doing today, at least from our view, uh, is obviously what we are providing them with is the ability to protect that key. Now, there's a number of keys, obviously, but the, the key one is really, excuse the pun, uh, is around the fact that the the key that actually signs in and out the, the crypto from the blockchain. So really what we're doing is we're trying to make that the part that is uh, the core to protection. Of, because if, if you lose that key, that's it, you, you're game over. So we have to make sure that that is as difficult or as, uh, improbable to recreate in any meaningful way by providing layers of protection. So for argument's sake, if you just have uh, MPC, that in itself is a very strong security layer because what you're doing is you're effectively creating uh, shares, key shares that effectively establish what the signing process would be if the private key existed. So in the way MPC functions or multi-party computation exists, is that you're using rounds of communication to establish what a private key would sign a particular transaction to be. So it doesn't exist. So the, the scenario is, is from a fail safe point of view, you have a failed state and you need to recover that key. Well, there are processes to do that, but they're not easy. Uh, but ultimately above the MPC process, we also need to layer in, as we mentioned earlier, other governance controls. You know, the, the, the key shares themselves have to be protected by hardware, uh, ultimately. And so wherever you are looking at, if we look at exponentially harder things to do, is if you place an MPC key share into software, well, it's good, but it's, it could be better. And it can always be made better by using hardware. So if you can use hardware to protect something, it's always going to be a good place to be. Now, if we take out the technology part of that, and then we look at the governance and the policy layer, well, before we even get anywhere near the private key, we should be actually looking at whether the transaction should be executed in the first place. Should it be a situation where we say, here is a transaction of a million dollars uh, or even a hundred million dollars or even more. And if we're operating in a hot environment, then there is a situation where the transaction is allowed and, and, it's, and it gets signed as well automatically. That's just because that's a, a function of a hot wallet. But if we're in a warm structure or we actually have a policy where we say, actually only a, a certain amount of assets are allowed to go out of this environment within a certain period of time, then we can limit some of the issues that we've seen in the past week where we're just not constantly hot and it's just allowing things to flow and, and go. But where you've got a warm structure, you can actually define, actually, if we hit a certain limit, let's stop this from going out. And then you minimize the impact of the actual breach. Yeah, that's a pretty holistic answer, um, you know, but I do think uh, it, a couple of things here. First, I think as a financial institution looking to get into crypto, you have to answer the core question of 
will it be the customer's keys in their crypto or you know are you, or are you holding that for them right because that has major implications of you know shared responsibility of who who needs to uh, take responsibility for some of the security of their keys right as soon as it's my key and my crypto then you know on the consumer side i'm doing this and it's about education of our consumer bases on utilizing hardware wallets why they should only keep a certain amount and stuff you know what regulations or limits are we going to put in place from a transaction perspective so when i go just like i go into a bank and i might have a daily withdrawal limit or a you know wire transfer limit uh crypto institutions have the same things for their customer base from a governance and compliance uh standard there uh, or governance layer kind of like what uh, Stuart was talking about um, so I, I think that's first and foremost, you know, is kind of making that critical distinction and then building security policies based on that. And then I think if it's on the institution side and you are controlling those keys, the only thing I would add to Stuart's, Stuart's response is, um, what is that interaction layer uh, where we do share keys with the customer or allow them to see something like that? And because uh, once again, it's a question of those Web2 technologies and interfaces meeting the blockchain. As soon as I display that in software, like Stuart says, there's always the risk that a software type vulnerability allows for somebody to view that key, just like what we saw with Badger Dow, right? Uh, was they were able to view keys and then game over, like Stuart said, I'm extracting crypto from your wallets and making a bunch of transfers. Um, so, you know, I think that's uh, the perspective I've had there. And to so, dovetail right into what you were chatting about, Stuart, and you just finished chatting about, Brian, I will add, maybe this is just my old FBI coming back. You've got to have an insider threat program of your critical employees. If you are any financial services institution anywhere in the world, this is like 101, separation of duties. You don't give the manager both combinations to the vault at the bank. You don't not poor English. You always have to have some human controls in place who is allowed to touch the keys to the kingdom, who is allowed to know where those keys are, who is authorized to check on and audit who has touched these assets. That's extremely important. You don't want to hire the guy that just got fired for embezzlement. <laughs> from the last company. And yet <laughs> it's Stuart's laughing out loud because yes, it happens. It quite frankly happens. And that's a human control. Yes, you've got to have regulatory compliance. You've got to have regulations inside the company. Also don't hire the guy that just ripped off the bank at his last job. You want to know that. You have to figure that out and don't let them in the building. Okay, that's very, um... Uh, very astute answers. The the I just in 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 light of the time, I just want to be cognizant of how much time we have left. And and Ryan, you had kind of alluded to this in in, in your answers. But when I think about smart contracts, about vulnerabilities, um, there was a hack. I think it was less than two weeks ago um, that drained thirty one million dollars. I think was the the number that I saw reported from from a service. How does it happen? Yeah. How do we stop it from happening? Certainly. So, you know, what is, you know, I think first is what understanding what a smart contract is and a smart contract is uh, kind of the uh, if then logic that exists behind kind of blockchain technology that allows it to execute certain decisions upon certain conditions. And this is all coded in code. Right. And, um, you know, this this code is uh, mainly written in new coding languages like Solidity and uh, things like that. But um, let's face it, our new technologies, developers are just starting to learn how to work with them. Just like every coding language before them, uh, there's going to be bugs, right? People are going to write software poorly uh, to allow uh, for threat actors to take advantage of those things. Um, 
you know, so I think the best things that we can do when we're looking at smart contracts are some of the things we've been discussing this entire webinar is run penetration testing, you know, and scenarios against those contracts, um, open up bug bounty programs for these things. So uh, there's a, a wildly hot uh, NFT blockchain based game that blew up a couple of weeks ago called Wolf Game uh, that did millions hundreds of millions of dollars uh within like three days of business well there was a uh, vulnerability within the smart contract that was allowing uh, extra production of resources within the game and it was very serious it would have destroyed kind of the whole economic community that the game had built up uh, they immediately shut down this uh, smart contract. They brought in three pen testing companies uh, to do, uh, you know, software analysis uh, of those uh, smart contracts. They instituted a brand new smart contract and had to have a migration plan over to the new smart contract for their customer base. These things all sound kind of familiar to us because it's what would happen in the real world today with any disaster recovery scenario if we were trying to recover our data right or from a customer breach so i think we think about it in the same way uh, it's just a new technology that we are uh, trying to protect in this case which is the smart contract uh, but vulnerability assessments static code assessments dynamic code assessments um you know checking the human element of who's developing this code, these things are all in, important here. And everything you just mentioned, Ryan, is called out, and Stuart will probably reinforce this, is called out in those checklists that cyber insurance companies are now handing you before they will issue you a policy, before they will even think about writing you a cyber liability policy. And oh yeah, that's down on page two, do you utilize a validation and verification tool like, and they don't say George's delicatessen down the street. They say one of these companies, do you use one of these? And that's again, very prescriptive. It's also telling you these are the best ones and you need to be using one of these, especially if we're going to insure you. Stuart, what, you, what has been yeah. your to that? Yeah, so it, exactly that. I think what we, it's, uh, it, it feels like deja vu. It's one of those scenarios where we've had this conversation, it seems, I think, we're in, Ryan, you mentioned that we've, we've gone through these iterations, these conversations, protect your web front end, protect your, your, your code base, put the right measures in place. You know, this stuff is not new. Uh, but I think what happens is when a new technology comes in, everyone kind of sits bolt upright and then starts to concern themselves because actually what we're probably seeing for the first time uh, it will, maybe not the first time, but certainly, uh, you know, there are significant numbers that are now uh, being involved and, and where it was behind a lock and key in a, in a major bank vault somewhere. Some of these things are more front and center. And actually, in many cases, we're not seeing uh, KYC. We're not knowing the customer when people are interacting with smart contracts. So that's another part of this, actually, is that we don't even know uh, who is actually interacting on some of these uh, contracts directly because there's no necessarily no KYC. So I think from that point of view, the, it comes back to, I keep saying it, and apologies if I sound like a, a broken record, but I think the scenario is that the only way you can sign in and out of those contracts is with the private key. And if that private key is exposed in any way, then the game's off. You, you, you're out. So uh, under no regards, yes, you should put every single um, lo lock and bell and whistle, whatever it is, guns, dogs, uh, whatever it is, fences, everything you need. Uh, to try and protect the, the, the underlying asset, the, the data center, whatever it is, everything should be protected. But if you open up the, the ability to see the private key, you, you can act as whoever you want. Um, so that's really critical. And ultimately, the, the governance layers as well. You, you've got to be able to say, well, is this person even allowed to do this? <laughs> you, know, you, could be the, you could be the CEO of the company and have the ability to sign stuff, but does that make them the right person to sign it? No, absolutely not. There needs to be governance in somewhere else in another part of the company, treasury, compliance, whomever it might be. Even the trading teams need to have levels of compliance. Otherwise, we see breaches which go back into the 90s, which uh, I know we discussed internally uh, between us yesterday, is the, <laughs> mentioning no names, but the scenario is, is that if you've got those breaches that are occurring where people are just allowed to run away and trade and trade and trade, and then it breaks ultimately the bank, then that's not good either. And that's not necessarily external threat, that's internal threat. 
And so we have to look at covering all angles, not just the external threat, but the internal threat too. Okay, all right. Thank you for that. Now, we do have, again, I'm just taking a look at the clock. We've got about five minutes left or even a little bit less. Um, we do have questions coming in from the audience. We're just trying to rank these. One I see, and maybe we could just run through um, what each of you are seeing recently, most currently, as the most common threats when it comes to crypto and cybersecurity, and just kind of highlight you know, what you see as, as, as most, pro most problematic and, and most frequent. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. So, you know, I think uh, I'll start one that's not necessarily a security threat, but it, it's a threat to kind of the industry as a whole right now, which is uh, lack of education. Uh, and so I think, you know, webinars like this uh, uh, coming together with the community to discuss what's happening with regulation, making proposals, right? Like these are all important things to do right now because, um, if we don't understand the industry, the technologies behind it, then we're not going to make smart decisions. I've seen, you know, a lot of uneducated texts around the threats to crypto and stuff and why crypto is scary, um, you know, that we need to get in front of as an industry um, because the technology is coming, it's coming fast and, and, you know, we need to be prepared for it. But um, I would say, you know, the, from a security perspective, um, you know, ransomware is one that we hear about today, but it's going to be, uh, to Stuart's point and all echo at this time, any attack that gets people at that private key, because it's going to be the way into the kingdom. Uh, so like I said, most people will uh, take the easiest way in. So they're going to look, where is that private key exposed within your infrastructure? Where can I poke in? Who can I bribe within the organization uh, who wants an easy payday to give me that information from an insider threat perspective? Th these are the discussions I would say are the most relevant threat. And, and I think from my point of view as well, actually the reverse question, is that some people also look at it's the it's the uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt the classic FUD conversation as well. Is that actually in defence of cryptocurrencies and digital assets? Is that people will suggest that it's because it's it's tightly linked to a ransomware attack, and people say, "Oh, pay me X number of Bitcoin to uh, to decrypt your your information and your data." But actually, <laughs> the irony behind this is that yes, that's that's the situation, but you can still see where those funds went. Uh, it, it's a situation where if uh, if I was to say to someone or if I'm asked the question and someone says, hang on a minute, surely digital assets is, is far more um, private. You can't see where it goes and, and, and who actually holds the asset. Well, that might be true to a certain extent. But my analogy there is, is go to the ATM, take out a thousand dollars and then tell me where it goes after that point. And so the, there's a there's a balance here I think we need to strike is I think what we've done here on this particular uh, webinar is that we've concentrated on the security and the issues of the coming system. But equally, what I think we also need to look at is what the current or what the future system will fix of the previous system. Uh, so the, the ability to be able to see every single transaction on every single blockchain going to every single wallet provides you with an entire history of where everything went at any time and point in time. You can't do that with the current system today. I suppose just to, to cap that off, Stuart, a fabulous uh, overview on that. And I'll just add, because we've all talked about it in one way, shape or form, uh, the most common threat is still basic cyber hygiene. And the cyber hygiene includes escalation of privilege. How do you stop that? How do you encrypt the data that you have at rest and transit in use? How do you hit the software res you know, resilience, uh, the validation and verification points of your software. These are things that both Stuart and you, Ryan, have talked about already, been around for 20 years, and they're still very difficult to do well. And that's how the bad guys are getting in constantly. It's the insider threat all the way to you're still using Java code. You're still using something that was out and has holes in it, and that's part of your base code. That will constantly be a problem. That will constantly be a weakness, which is why you need to bring a group like Fireblocks on to handle these things and a group like Armor as a managed security service provider to help you tighten some of those things up. 
Thanks, Don. Thank you all. We've run up against the clock, um, but thank all the panelists for an excellent uh, and informative discussion. Um, to our webcast attendees, I hope you found these insights valuable, um, and to Alt 5 Sigma um, for bringing together this expertise and sponsoring the event. Uh, I hope to see you all again in the coming quarter and wishing you all a happy, safe, and healthy holiday season. Thank you, Bob.